It's all right. Um, it's great, so great to be with um, you all this morning. Yeah, I've met some of you, but if I haven't met you, my name's Tim. Uh, my wife couldn't be here today. Her name's Tam, so it's nice and easy to remember. We're Tim Tam. We, and um, we also have a chocolate Labrador, which is nice. Um, our daughter's name is Allegra. That doesn't really fit, but it's but she's she's great. And um, yeah, I just um, yeah so grateful for the privilege to come and, and share with you. We are going to do a bit of a workshop. There's some um, papers getting handed out and pens, which we'll use in a moment. Um, but yeah, I just just wanted to encourage you and and thank you as a church and particularly Pat and T. Um, haven't known you guys for very long. But in the short sort of time that I've been able to come and visit here and, and be a part of things that you've hosted and just get to know T and Pat and your families, it's just been an abundance of grace in, into my life. Um, I know some of your story and, and particularly some of T and Pat's story and there's been a lot of similarities with my story, but my story kind of was dragged out over like 10 years and these guys have experienced something quite strong and powerful in the Lord in like two years and, and it's just actually been an abundance of grace into my life to, to connect in that way. And yeah, I'm a bit raw. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, but just just the way that you guys worship is is amazing. Like, and li- literally, I couldn't worship because I was just weeping at the back. And so I'm like, how am I going to preach now? <laughs> and um, but you guys are called Grace House, and I think there's just such an abundance of of grace here that that I've experienced through coming here and then again in a surprising way by coming here and, and just, just particularly just the way that you guys worship, the way that you have different generations and cultures together worshiping and, and the, the expression of the kingdom that's here is just so special and, and powerful. Um, so I just am so appreciative and, and thankful for that as well. Um, so um, what we want to do today is, is, yeah, T asked me to be really practical and, and, and talk about... Um, yeah, God's Word and delighting in God's Word. Um, there's so much that I'd like to share on this, uh, but I sort of thought we could just, yeah, be really practical. Um, the Bible's a huge uh, topic. We could, we, there's so many different theological things and how we approach the Bible that we could talk about. Um, and my story with the Bible has been very conflicted, like the times of very much being hungry for Scripture and, and loving it, and then times of being very confused and even fearful and, and disinterested and, and not sure about it at all. And, and I think part of following Jesus is the wrestle, that there's a wrestle that, that we're on and that he's, there's grace in that too. Um, but what I yeah, want to do is actually just share with you a method of, of reading Scripture that has been incredibly beneficial in my life, um, which I didn't really learn um, uh, growing up, I didn't really learn until I did a, a particular school through through YWAM and just transformed my understanding of the Bible. Um, it's called the inductive method of reading Scripture, and the, the whole idea is really trying to let the Bible speak for itself. Um, there's lots of different ways of reading Scripture. Um, a really most common way is a devotional approach, where we sort of read in the, in the mornings maybe, or just read a chapter and, and let it speak to our hearts and inform our prayers, and that's awesome and great. Another type of reading Scripture is what's maybe called a deductive approach, where we go to Scripture with our questions and, and with our topics, and or maybe even with a hypothesis. We think that this is true, so we see, is it biblical or not? Um, but another way to read Scripture is called the inductive reading of Scripture, which actually says, let's just start with Scripture. Let's as much as possible try to remove our biases and our thoughts and our opinions and just say, what does the Bible want to talk about? What's, what's, what does the Bible say is important? Because sometimes the Bible's actually not really interested in our questions. You might have a question, and it's not the question that the Bible wants us to ask. So actually, it's trying to get ourselves out of the way as much as possible and come to this text and let it speak for itself. Because the amazing thing is um, that God speaks, right? We have a God who speaks. And like you sort of think, well, that's like Christianity 101. That's obvious, right? But it's profound. God, God speaks. The start of the Bible, God speaks creation into existence. Jesus is the Word. He speaks through His Word. He speaks by His Spirit. He's a personal God. Who The reason we can know Him is because he reveals himself to us. He shares himself with us. He speaks. And what's actually the primary way that God speaks to us? 
You might be thinking the Bible, but what does the Bible say is the primary way that God speaks to us? In Hebrews, it says that in times long ago, God spoke through the prophets, but in these last days, He speaks by His Son. The Word is Jesus. God speaks primarily to us through Jesus. And the Bible is primarily, like the Bible Project say, the Bible Project's awesome, they say the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. It's the backstory of God's plan in history leading to His Son coming, and then it's the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and it's the story of the church that He has left, and the story of the end of Jesus' return. The Bible is all about Jesus, which seems obvious, but still, it sometimes needs to be said. God speaks to us through Jesus, and we can encounter Jesus through the Word. So, what I want to do is, again, just try and be really practical. Um, so, what we're going to do is, is try this method um, of reading Scripture inductively, which means trying to read the Bible as it was written, as it was originally understood. Because um, the way that we approach the Bible really matters, and sometimes we approach it just as this book that maybe fell out of heaven or as an instruction manual, or as, or as dot points, or as a theological book that God's speaking directly to us. But when we actually come to read it, it's actually very human. There's so many human elements to the Bible, and if we just approach it as God directly speaking to us, you get some weird things happening, like Paul telling you that he forgot his cloak, and you need to go get his cloak. It's like, I think Paul's cloak is gone. <laughs> like, like, if he's speaking that directly to me, that doesn't make any sense. Like, that was to Timothy at a particular time. Jesus said to his disciples, don't go to the Gentiles, right? Like, if we take that as God's word directly to us, then who are we supposed to minister to? We're not allowed to go to the Gentiles. So, there's all these human elements that context is so important, but it's also, the Bible's not just an account of the times that God has spoken. The Bible claims itself to be God speaking. We read so many stories about God speaking in the Bible, But Scripture says that actually the Scripture, the accounts of God speaking, is also God speaking. It is inspired. It's both human and divine, in many ways similar to Jesus, who is fully human and fully God. So what we're going to do is take the smallest book of the Bible to start with, which is nice and easy, Philemon, and we're going to approach this trying to read it um, inductively, trying to take it as as a text and let it speak for itself. And one way to do that um, is to think, like, the way that we read the Bible is not how we read other, other things normally, because if you receive a letter from a friend, you don't just break it up into chapters and verses and then just take one, right? Like, if you receive a letter, you read the whole letter. In, in the same way in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, a lot of these books are letters, and they need to be understood as a, as a whole, um, you're probably aware that the, the chapters in the Bible and the verses were added long time after they were written, that they're not, they're not included by the authors. So what we're trying to do is, is get back to, well, wh- when Paul wrote this, um, what did he mean? When it was received by the recipients, how did they understand it to mean? And to do that, what we can do is actually read it as a whole. Another way that it was probably written in that time is, is not the way that we read it today. Not everyone didn't have their own Bible or a Bible on their phone or, or a Bible that they would read in the morning. This would be read by a church uh, in community, out loud, and mostly heard. And it's actually quite a profound thing to recognize the Bible's really written to be heard. It's not primarily written to be just read. Um, there's actually something powerful about their reading out loud. Um, or listening to it. It's actually meant for us to hear it, not just see it. So, what we're going to do is read this letter, um, and as much as possible, trying to imagine that we're in a, in a house church in the first century. Um, it's written by Paul. Uh, we'll find out he's in prison. Uh, we're gathered, and there's a new letter, and we'll see what it's about. But I'm just going to read it um, and I want you to, to listen. You do have a copy of it um, there with you as well. I'm going to read from the ESV. And not listen to it primarily as speaking to us, but listen to it primarily. How would the original hearers, the original audience, have heard this text? So let's, let's read it. But as we are reading this, it is inspired by God. So we're also inviting the Holy Spirit to speak to us as we go through this process. 
Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though, I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord, Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. There we go, we just read a whole book of the Bible. Um, it's not often the way that we approach the Bible. It's actually really powerful. And, and if you haven't really done that before, I just really encourage you to, to try that. Obviously, that's nice and quick. It's a, it's a small letter. Some others might take a couple of hours or quite a few hours. But actually reading a book as a whole and just letting it wash over you and get the whole picture of it is really powerful. Um, particularly doing that with a gospel and just letting Jesus' life wash over you, getting friends around, invite friends around on a Friday night and just read a chapter each and go through the whole gospel. And it's like watching a movie and it's amazing. Um, the, the Bible's really meant to be more read like that in community and more holistically um, as books or, or large sections. So we're doing this one just because it's, it's nice and quick and we don't have very much time and, and I've never done a workshop like this before, so we'll just see how this goes. Um, but I just wanted to share with you some of these, these tools and this approach, which, which might be new or it might be something you already know. But where we start is simply reading. Then the next step in this method is to observe. Now, the, the kind of where we want to go normally is we really want to quickly figure out, well, what does this mean? Or maybe what does it mean for me? Because maybe listening to that, you might be thinking, that doesn't seem to be relevant to me at all. <laughs> like, or maybe that was just a whole confusing mess of what's even going on here. Um, so what, we don't start with that. We start with simply observing. So what I'm going to get you to do for a few minutes is to do this. Um, to, with your pen um, on the text that you have, take some time just to look carefully at this text. I'm only going to give you a few minutes, so it's, it's not long. Um, I've already, we've already said some things about it. But there's a list of dot points of some things that you can look for, and there's others that you might notice as well. Um, who the letter's from or to, places mentioned, anything you can learn about the people. Because obviously this letter's written in a context. There's a whole backstory that if we don't understand, this what, what Paul's saying doesn't make any sense. So can you tell some of the backstory or get any clues as to what's going on from this letter? Just some other things you can simply look for are things that are repeated. 
What's, what, what keeps getting said again and again? Or are there any figures of speech or metaphors? What sort of atmosphere or tone is this written in? Some letters are really intense and angry. Some are joyful. Uh, some are a mix. And in this one in particular, there's a cool feature where there's a play on words. So I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes. If you get through all that, you can also look at Colossians 4, which informs this letter as well. But yeah, literally, I'm probably going to give you like three minutes, four minutes. It's not long, um, but just observe. And again, we can do this in community, so feel free to talk with people next to you, feel free to share with others. So you could spend a lot of time observing. Um, it's good to spend a fair bit of time here. And, and again, it can be tempting to try to jump to, well, what does this mean? Um, but there's, there's, it's great to really try and start there just, just looking. And uh, some other things you can do is reread again and again, read different translations, um, and just, just start to notice. And often it takes a bit more time. That was a very short amount of time to give yourself if that just didn't feel like beneficial at all, don't worry. Um, uh, that was very short, and, and I'm just trying to give you some tools today. 
Um, but often, the, the more time you take, if you just if just sort of sit in it, you start to notice things. And, and obviously, the, Bible, the Bible's like that. You can read it hundreds and hundreds of times. You just always notice new things. Um, so there's, there's an invitation to, to dig deep in observing. So quickly, just some of the things that you might have noticed, like we already talked about the letters from Paul. Um, it's called Philemon or Philemon, however you want to say that. Uh, it's obviously addressed to him. It's also addressed to Aphia, Archippus, and the church, which is interesting, right? So it's, it's addressed to an individual, but um, these other people who are potentially even his family members, and there's a church in their house. So it's kind of like a personal letter, but there's it, it this sort of public nature of it a little bit as well. Uh, there's not many places mentioned, but Paul's obviously in prison. Um, he's sending someone called Onesimus. You might have been able to pick up some of the relationships that are going on, that Onesimus is a slave of Philemon, uh, who's run away or is not with him, uh, potentially has taken money, um, but met Paul. Um, Paul calls Onesimus his son, so he has a very close relationship with him. Paul also has a really close relationship with Philemon. He's very affectionate and, and thankful, and he's praying for him, and, and he's his brother, and so there's these close relationships going on. Um, so we can sort of say this, well, there's all this whole backstory to this letter that's actually quite controversial, that, that this slave has run away um, and met Paul and seems to have been converted, uh, but he's kind of stolen money potentially, and to run away is a crime in that context. And so there's just all this backstory that we can kind of see. Uh, you might have noticed some things repeated. There's, there's probably lots of different ones. One thing, I just read it through again last night, and I was like, What's repeated again and again? Christ. Paul's always talking about Jesus. Like, the New Testament, the, the Bible is just all about Jesus. And when I did this study, I was, it sounds silly, but I was surprised. By, like, if you go through all the New Testament letters, what are they about? Jesus. Like, that's the point. And Paul mentions Christ so much here, even in this short letter. He also mentions a lot that he's in prison. <laughs> I'm in prison. Have you heard I'm in prison? <laughs> Remembering I'm suffering? Like, he just seems to keep bringing it up again and again. He obviously mentions love, faith, the idea of being useful or useless as well, which kind of linked to this play on words, that Onesimus, his name, means useful. So Paul is sort of using this tug-and-cheek play on words in, in what we'll get to with this request. And the atmosphere is sort of, how, how is Paul writing? Like, he's obviously very affectionate towards Philemon, but he's also being pretty strong, and he's also kind of going back and forth a bit. It's this interesting dynamic that's going on. So there's a whole lot of context there that we can just get from observing. Um, you can also get context from reading commentaries and, and Bible dictionaries, which is really awesome, but you can actually just get a lot just by looking carefully at the text and seeing what you can learn. Um, if you got a chance to have a look at Colossians 4, um, it's interesting because in this section, Onesimus is mentioned as well as coming to Colossae with another person named Tychicus. So it seems like actually the letter to Colossians was delivered at the same time as the letter to Philemon, and Tychicus and Onesimus are going together, So which means that Philemon's probably in Colossae. So we can kind of deduce a lot of and, and uh, or sort of find, find out a lot of things just by looking and observing. So that's the first step. The next step then is to start to move to interpretation. But we're not yet thinking about what this means for us. We're actually just saying, what did it mean for them? What did it mean for the original audience? Because the way the Bible's written is in a particular time and place and context. And it's similar, again, to Jesus, Right? Jesus is God's word to us, and he entered a particular time, a particular place, a particular context. Jesus didn't come to Brisbane. He didn't come to Australia. He went to Israel. He went to Galilee. He wasn't in the 21st century. He was in the 1st century. Yet, Jesus is relevant for all. So he, he was limited to a context and, and found in a context, but that speaks to everybody. And in a similar way, the Bible's written that it speaks into a context at a particular place, particular time, particular person, yet when we understand what it meant for them, we can understand what the Holy Spirit might be speaking to us, because the Holy Spirit has inspired this text. So I'm going to give you some more time, and we're going to go through and ask this question a bit deeper. What did this mean? when they heard it. Because I think when, if you can imagine sitting in that church and getting this letter, 
this would like blow your mind. Like this is a full on thing that Paul is saying, if we can really understand the context. So have another couple of minutes, have a think. Why is Paul writing this letter? What's really his purpose? And when people heard him, what are they understanding him to mean? And in light of the context and the culture, if you know anything about that time, what's the significance of that? A couple of other interpretation questions. We could ask lots, but an interesting one. Why doesn't Paul command Philemon to do what is required? He says, I'm not commanding you. Why, why does he say that? Let me just have some a, a think and process. And then he repeats his imprisonment so much. Why would he do that? Why is he repeating his imprisonment? And what does he mean when he says, I'm sending my very heart? So I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes again. Um, so you're thinking, what did it mean to them? Just to jot down some thoughts. And feel free to share ideas. Feel free to see what someone next to you thinks as well. Let's see if you, feel, if you notice any other good interpretive questions or, or things that you're wondering about, feel free to jot them down. You're not limited to those ones.
just give you another couple of minutes. I, I just encourage you to just share with somebody else what, what you're thinking, see what they think. Because, again, the Bible's designed to be read in, in community, and it's not really how we often read it. We, we tend to read it individually because we're individualist culture, but it's, it's written in very much a communal culture. So um, if you need to move, feel free. Um, but just, yeah, ask someone next to you or someone behind you, uh, just ha- how are they understanding? What does this letter actually? What did it mean to them when they first read it? And you might even also just share, like, if there's anything really perplexing or, like, confusing, like, you have a question about it, like, that's an awesome thing to share and wonder about, too. So again, I'd love to have more, more time and even to be able to be a bit more interactive, but um, I'll just sort of share some, some responses to what you might have discussed um, with, with this, with some of these, these questions. Um, yeah, so like what, what, what's really going on and what, what's this letter about? Because now hopefully we understand some of the context a bit more, some of the backstory, and even rereading it again with that in mind. Because when, when someone sends you a letter, you have a relationship with them that has a whole lot of history, and they don't have to fill you in in all of the history. You, you, they know that you know it, so they just speak to you. And it's similar with biblical letters. Like, Paul doesn't need to fill everybody in in the backstory. He just speaks to them. But then we can kind of figure out some of the backstory by, by observing and then starting to interpret. So we, we see, right, that Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon. So the, he's a slave who's run away, He's been helping Paul in his imprisonment, and he's sending him back, and he's sending him with this letter and with a request. And what's the request? Is that he forgives him, and that he welcomes him. And what is that significance of that in that that day and age? And we could do some more study about slavery, but like, this is actually an injustice in that culture, in that, that Philemon is the property of so, sorry, Onesimus is the property of Philemon. Now, whatever we think about slavery, that's not the issue. The issue is just the context. In that context, that was how it was. And he ran away, which is, which is illegal and punishable, potentially by death. And more than that, he probably stole. And more than that, he probably humiliated Philemon and probably caused even more costs to him. Um, yet he converted... And now he's been helping Paul. He's being beneficial to Paul. His name means useful. Uh, Philemon thought he was useless. He's a slave that runs away and steals things. Paul says, no, in Christ, he's useful. 
He's fulfilling his name, and he's still useful. Paul wants him to come back, potentially, and help him more, but he doesn't want it to do it without Philemon's blessing. Um, and it's interesting, right, because this little letter, then, is a profound critique of slavery of that time, not a head-on critique. Paul doesn't critique slavery. Paul just simply says to Philemon, Onesimus, your slave, is actually your brother. I want you to welcome him as a brother. And if he welcomes him as a brother, he can't be his slave, right? It, it fully undermines slavery, but not head-on, subversively. It's a profound thing that, that Paul is, is doing. Um, then, um, well, why doesn't he command it then? He says, I could command you in the Lord, but I'm not. And again, he talks so much about love in this letter. Um, I actually haven't studied it. Just on the way here, I was thinking, like, Philemon seems to be linked to, to I don't know if it's li even linked to the Greek word for love. It se seems potentially that there could be some sort of play on words there even. Um, but he doesn't want this act of forgiveness and generosity to be by compulsion. He wants it to be in love. So he's actually making a request. And he's almost making, a, he's asking for a favor almost, on, uh, for a friend. Will you do this for me, Philemon? But, what, but why does he then mention his imprisonment so much? Um, I, I think he's like, he wants to make a request, but he's kind of buttering him up a lot. Like, or even almost putting the guilt trip on almost. It's like, oh, I'm poor. I'm an old man. I'm in prison. Did I mention I'm in prison? Would you please do this? Like, like instead of just commanding him, he's like doing this thing of like trying to appeal to Philemon out of love for Paul, to receive Onesimus back, which, which might be, have been a humbling thing as well, to, to receive him back. Then he says, because Paul says he's sending his very heart. So this is a vulnerable thing for Paul. Paul loves Onesimus. And in some ways, there's some risk here. Like Philemon legally could punish him or kill him. Um, Paul doesn't think that's going to happen, but there's still a risk. He's sending his heart and says that he'll pay the debt. So this is actually just a small letter that when you kind of read it the first time, it's just like, what is the point of any of this? But when you start to get some context, it's profound, and it, it's amazing. So then what we want to do is then we'll think, well, then what does it actually mean for us? So obviously this was, this was a significant request for Philemon. There's a whole lot of different things going on here, but what does it mean for us? Um, what, what we'll do is, is I'll just encourage you to maybe think about these questions maybe later today or during the week. We'll, we'll just keep going for now, but we could just look at these and I'll give you some, some thoughts. But what we do is once we understand what it means for them, we ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us and think, well, then how does that speak into our hearts? Sometimes it, it's actually quite direct. We might be in a very similar circumstance and is it quite a direct application. Sometimes it's really indirect and we need like a principle or we need some sort of example of the gospel that then will challenge us. Um, so some of the questions that you can see here are just what, is, what aspect of the gospel does this demonstrate? I think when I've been studying this again, one of the best things that's been relevant to me is just that this is just a beautiful picture of the gospel. Paul is, is the, an embodiment of Christ in his, the way that he's speaking as someone who's suffering, as someone who's vulnerable, as someone who's appealing, as someone who's guilty. As Paul says, he's willing to pay the debt He's really being an example of Christ, and this story is an example of the gospel. It's also an example of the gospel transforming hearts and transforming society in countercultural ways. And that Paul's calling him to this act of forgiveness that actually countercultural and undermines the status quo of slavery of the time. Again, this is an example that may be relevant for us. What might be God calling us to do that's countercultural, that's subversive? that demonstrates the gospel and that go beyond maybe what we would be expected to in our culture. I think another thing that kind of might speak, um, and has spoken to me just going through this, is just, again, that Paul says he could command, but he doesn't. He, he wants it to be free and, and willing. And again, I think that's so much God's heart, right? Obviously, he does command us to do things, and Paul does command people to do things, but the goal is love which comes from a free choice. And when we're following Christ, um, Paul calls himself a prisoner of Christ, right? That's his self-identification, right? It's not because he has to 
be a prisoner of Christ. It's because he chooses to identify himself. I want to follow Christ as a prisoner of Christ. In a similar way, maybe there's things that God's calling us to do, particularly even with this letter, potentially even to do with reconciliation, that actually the goal is not that we do it out of duty because we must or because we have to, but actually from love, not compulsion, but free choice. So again, we could spend a lot more time there. I just, the goal is just to give you a couple of tools today of the inductive method, which is to read, observe, interpret, and apply. And the, the goal of this is, is more of a study approach to Scripture, right? And the goal, though, is not just to get a stack of knowledge. Um, the goal is not just to understand background context and how things were and just to be a Bible nerd. That's not the point. Um, again, the point is to see Jesus, to know Jesus, to follow Jesus, to engage with the Bible because it's Jesus' story, and as we understand his story and his way, we understand and know him more. Um, approaching the Bible without recognizing and knowing Jesus is, is pointless. And it says in John 20, 31, just of the Gospel of John, but it's relevant, I think, to the whole Scripture, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's, that's the goal. So I hope that's been... Um, helpful for you today. Again, just, just a quick overview. I encourage you to, to dig deep and to experiment with some of those, those tools and this approach to Scripture. Um, I think maybe it probably is maybe easiest if we just go straight into a Q&A and then um, got something else that if it works out later, we can do that. But if not, that's okay. Awesome, awesome. Uh, we'll just get the, the chairs out, and so um, I'll give you guys a, a minute to talk amongst yourselves, um, I don't know, share how your week was, if it was good, if it wasn't, maybe keep it to yourself. All right. <laughs> just, just somebody sitting there just really waiting to unburden themselves. <laughs> All right, so um, just a reminder, if you have any questions... Um, text them through to that number, and through the power of the internet, uh, I will receive them on my phone, and we will we will get into our Q and A. So first, first I just want to um, so we're, we're gonna have a bit of a, a panel up here. So firstly, uh, Tim is gonna be on a panel. So uh, as well, we're gonna have uh, two people from from our church as well. I'd like to invite up Carmela Rubio. Give him a round of applause. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Brian Robertson uh, as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, if you just want to hop up there, Tim, and um, and we'll pass we'll pass the mic around. You guys could probably sit closer together. Um, <clears throat> that's going to make passing the mic a lot easier. <clears throat> awesome. Cool, cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I'm going to throw this one um, to the group. I might, I might choose some other questions to, 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 uh, to give to individuals. But um, all right, here's, here's one that's come through. Uh, what if someone finds Scripture reading boring and hard? Uh, how does that change? They anyone want to jump in and try and answer that? <laughs> Firstly, I'm sad if you find it boring and hard, but there are places that you go into the Bible and you go, I don't get this, and so you might avoid them thinking it's boring. But if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, the place to be fed is in the Word. If you don't have the Holy Spirit guiding you and leading you, go by your own brain. Go in there, but make sure you go there. I find it really good to have a Bible reading plan. Hopefully that's not the only thing you do to read your Bible, but you'll get through the Bible in a year by reading approximately four chapters a day. And I read a book a while ago. I'm not going to go on forever, don't worry. 20 ways our telephones, have, our mobile phones have changed us. And one of the only benefits there was there was many more people read their Bible better because of a mobile phone. It makes it so easy. You can actually click on an app 
and go, what do I read today? And it tells you. You don't have to think because if you get your Bible out and go, where am I going to read today? Oh, yeah, I've read that. Oh, yeah, I know that part. Oh, that's too hard. You, you, you can actually get there, open your Bible and not even read and close it. If you've got the app, you click on it, it can read it to you. Did you mention that? Oh, okay. I thought maybe, you, I think you did in there. And that is just a great thing. Have the Bible read to you and follow along. It just can't get any easier than that. And hopefully, especially if you find different parts difficult, go to the Gospels and just listen to your Lord the way he deals with people. The wisdom, the strength, the love and the compassion. And when you see Jesus more, the Bible won't be boring because it is what Tim said. It's a unified uh, book with one theme pointing to Jesus. Hopefully that will help. Yeah, that's right. I think one of the reasons that um, you do find, well, there's a tendency to find it boring is that you just don't understand what you're reading. And uh, like a lot of the translations too, um, they're different because they are a translation from an original Greek or Hebrew. And the words just don't make sense. And, and that's difficult too. But I think if you just come back to the first things first. And I remember when our kids were little, they'd grab a, a book and they'd snuggle up to us and they would read to them. And quite often it was more about the cuddle than it was about the book. And I think that should always be uh, our first attitude. We're actually spending time with our Lord and Saviour, someone who loves us and someone whom we love. And uh, we're spending time with them. And and we're told also, sorry, this is a big topic, isn't it? Um, we're told that the Holy Spirit can be our teacher. So as we sit down, we say, Lord, please speak to me. Holy Spirit, please speak to me and be with me. And may I encounter you when I read this book. So that just transforms what you're doing. You're not reading a book like any other book. You are actually encountering the living God, which makes it so, so different. And then the other point I would make is you need to understand some big picture markers so you understand what you're reading. And for me, the biggest one was to understand when the New Testament actually starts. So if you open your Bible, there's this big page between Malachi and Matthew which says the New Testament. And that's telling you when the New Testament scriptures start. But the New Testament itself, the New Covenant, didn't actually start until Jesus died. It's the New Covenant in his blood. We're told in Galatians, Jesus was born of a woman under the law and died under the law. So Jesus was born under the Old Testament, lived under the Old Testament, and died under the Old Testament. And that's really, really important because when you're reading the Gospels, which we'd love to read, there are a lot of things about New Testament living, but there's also some stuff about Old Testament living. And we need to know which parts are relevant to us, which parts... Um, uh, yeah, have application for us. So, for example, in Mark 10, where there's this rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? Jesus starts listing off the, the Ten Commandments. Well, have you done that? Have you done that? Have you done that? And he says, well, yes, I have. But the point is, if, if we came to Jesus today and said, what must I do to be saved? It would just be believe on me and everything that I've done. Because as Paul says, we're not under the law anymore, we're under grace. So that's really, really important that we don't get ourselves confused. We need to know the big picture markers. Um, anyway, that really helped me understand the Bible because I was like, which pits, what's going on? Again, there's the backstory. Yeah, sorry. Mm. No, that, that, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. Which would... Um, yeah, so that probably would lead, lead us into the next one. Maybe, maybe it's a little bit taking that, uh, that first question a little bit deeper. Um, what do you do with parts of Scripture that seem offensive or actually just don't make any sense? Um, like, like what, what, this, yeah, we'll, we'll throw to Tim on this one. <laughs> yeah, we'll let, we'll, we'll let, we'll let, we'll let um, the visitor handle that one. Because um, we're so good at hospitality, uh, we'll let it... <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I hope that maybe just what we did was maybe an experiment of that. Um, that when I read Philemon, it, it doesn't make any sense when I read it just without any context, but then with some context. And someone might also read it and say, like, why is Paul sending, why does Paul have a slave? Why is Paul sending a slave back? Like, why isn't Paul critiquing slavery? Like, but then when we understand it, we see actually he is. He's, he's fully critiquing slavery, but it's subversive. And there's so many times when I've, um, yeah, through teaching ministry, are forced to deal with difficult passages because we just preach through a book of the Bible, and it and it's obviously often very daunting. But at the same time, wrestling with it and then engaging with it and actually seeing the truth in it is often amazing. There's often an amazing truth um, behind it. Um, so I guess that means to to actually be drawn in by those things rather than turn off to to wrestle with them and and wonder about them. And it's okay to have have questions and and just ponder. Um, I guess things that are really difficult, we just need to interpret things in light of what we do know about God's heart, what we do know about Jesus, and, and um, sometimes maybe we're not exactly sure how to make sense of that in light of that, but we do know this, who he is. Um, and often maybe what may look really bad at the surface, when we understand the context, we understand the background, actually does make a lot more sense. Um, but yeah, so I guess just encouragement to, to engage with Scripture because it's good, God is good, the things that God says is good, so even if it doesn't look like it, it is, and sometimes we just have to simply trust and, and yeah, just rest in, and be in the wrestle in the midst of it. Awesome. Um, this, this one's maybe um, probably a, a lot more along the lines of, of practical, I guess, interpretation and application. Um, and, and maybe, Brian, you'd have more to say on this, um, given your answer before. You said, you know, you, it's important for you to understand kind of like where things sort of sit um, within the covenants and all sorts of stuff. Um, somebody's put through a question about, you know, like how do, when we read the New Testament, uh, and I'm guessing particularly the letters here because they reference like head coverings and that sort of stuff, Paul gives a whole bunch of recommendations to different churches um, about how they should conduct themselves. Um, wh- what do we do with those? How do we know? How do we know which ones are, are just like straight? Yes, this is for us always, uh, or is you know, that that's more context? Like, is in how how would you approach that sort of thing? Okay, um, this is a great question. I think Tim uh, touched on this uh, in his talk. Um, it's, it's understanding the, the backstory, it's understanding the culture, and then within that, there's always a take-home truth. There's always a timeless truth for all cultures and all ages. It may not be, it won't be like the literally the women should have a head covering, but there will be a truth behind that that is still applicable. So this is where uh, we need to, need to get a bit of help because we're not going to find that in the pages of the Bible. Um, And so this is where we might delve into uh, a commentary or a Bible dictionary. Uh, And and that's, uh, this is, it's kind of a dangerous waters to go into though because just because a book is in uh, your local Christian bookstore doesn't mean that it's it's got the approval of God upon it. And um, that's a really important thing to know. So you have to be Holy Spirit led uh, as to what you read other than the Bible, which books to go to for help. And some of the stuff in there will be really, really helpful, and some of it won't be. And again, it's, it's engaging with the Holy Spirit. Please be my teacher as I read this book. Such an important thing to say. And then if we understand the original culture, then suddenly, that, that, uh, as we go through that process that Tim outlined for us, then that, uh, the, the, the take-home truth will become evident. Uh, um, but having said that, <laughs> with the head coverings, thanks for that one. Um, <laughs> God bless you who came up with that one. That's, there's like three or four different interpretations as to what the take-home truth may be. And then you just sit and you just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And, and just one thing I want to encourage people with. There are people who have spent 40 years studying the book of Ezekiel, right? So there's, no one is an expert on the Bible. And don't feel intimidated by it. Just start. Just start and allow God to speak to you. Because just as we have a body that needs food, so our spirit needs to be fed. And, and you may even know passages of the Bible, and you may have heard them a hundred times. Your mind's, mind may not need to know them, but your spirit still does. You, kind of, you come to the Word to feed on the Word, because no man lives by bread alone, but on every word of God.
That's, that's really good. I, I, yeah, I, if, if I could add anything to that, I would say when you do come across those kind of passages, you're like, you know, Paul's like, you know, women cover your heads when you're praying. You're like, man, I've seen women pray in church and they did not cover their heads. You know, everyone here is sinning. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we approach, well, sometimes we get to those communities like that seems out of place for like what we do culturally. I would encourage you, take that to a good godly friend and go, hey, have you read this one? What, like, how, how, what's your take on this? And get their answer and, and then take it to another friend. And, and, and actually, I would encourage you to be taking your questions about Scripture to the community of faith and reading it all together. You know, it's, it's the Holy Spirit speaks to us and He leads us and He guides us and, and he'll, he'll often use all the different pieces. And now when I say pieces, you all, to begin to inform interpretation and, and, and you know, in certain cultural settings, they, they, they might feel that it's actually appropriate for women to wear head coverings in, the, in their cultural setting. Others might not, maybe, you know. So I would encourage you to read in the, in the midst of community um, and you'll actually be surprised at, at how well the Spirit leads and guides even through, even through that. So I've um, <clears throat> got uh, maybe one last one. Um, maybe for those who've been challenged that, you know, we, we've, we've talked about, you know, reading the Scripture, loving the Scripture. Maybe there's some people here who are like, I, I know I should read the Bible. Um, I don't love it. And perhaps you're, you're feeling... Um, a little bit ashamed about that this morning or, or conflicted over that this morning. Um, how important is it for me to read the Bible regularly and will God be angry with me if I don't? Anyone want to jump on that one? Um, yeah, I can just make a couple of comments. Um, I guess I find for me, um, like, like what you were saying before, that when I, when I mostly want to read Scripture is when I'm hungry for it, when, when I have a vision of Jesus and I'm, I'm excited about God and I, and I want to read it. When, when I'm reading it because I feel like I have to, it, it, it's a lot harder. Um, and and there's, there's an element of discipline that's important, but, but discipline is not the, for the sake of discipline. Uh, in the, in, what I mean, I guess, is we don't read the Bible for the sake of reading the Bible. Like, you don't go to the gym because the lifts, the weights need someone to pick them up. Like, like that's not the point of going to the gym. The, the Bible doesn't need to be to be read. What what we need is to hear from God. We we need God to speak to us. And and when we're in touch with that need, um, and we're hungry for that need, there's there's a desire to seek it. So I guess if it's if it has just become a duty, um, the, the the goal is not to just keep going just in duty, but kind of try to re-engage our hearts. And it's not that, yeah, we're doing it to try and, I, like, God doesn't just want us to read the Bible for the sake of it. That, that, that doesn't please Him. He wants us to listen to Him. Um, so, so it's not that He's upset at us. It's that maybe He's grieved that we're not coming to Him, um, but it's not like a judgment thing. It's, it's His heart of love for us. Thanks, Tim. I just want to add something practical. I said before you'd get the Bible read in one year if you read four chapters. But for some people, that's probably like, oh, I don't think I can listen to four chapters a day. If you go into the U Bible, there are countless Bible reading plans. Some of them are three days, some are seven days, a month, uh, leading from reading the Bible in one year to reading the Bible in two years to reading the New Testament in one year. Start somewhere. A and I agree with Tim there does have to be an element of, of discipline. And that means if you get up with just enough time to get to work, you're going to need to change something if morning's the time you do this. If you get home and you're tired and wrecked and you can't think Bible or anything else, then you might want to do it in the morning. But if you're the other way, leave time at the end of the day, great. But as with going to the gym, most people who start out in the morning are more successful. There's more success among those who say, I'm going to do it in the morning. And then you've got it done. Awesome. Um, I, I, uh, a few people have messaged you asking, like, what resources and that sort of stuff. I don't think we're going to uh, fill the time, but if you're curious about what resources um, maybe would be helpful for you to read and understand the Scriptures, I want to encourage you to grab either Brian or Tim or Carmelo after the service and ask them. Um, these are all men who read and love the Scriptures, have been benefited, have read many books before, um, and, and will probably have a book or two that you might find helpful and useful. Um, and so what I'm going to do is um, I think we're going to wrap it up there, and uh, I'm going to invite the worship team up.
uh, for one last song. Just uh, th thank our panel real quick. Give them a round of applause. All right, so what we're going to do is um, I'll, get you to, I'll get you to stand. And, um, and so the worship team's going to lead us out with a song, and, and the team's going to just keep playing as long as people want to stay here and, and do business with the Lord. Perhaps um, the Holy Spirit's dealing with you over the discipline of, of, of spending time in His Word. Um, God loves you. He wants you to be spending time in His Word. And, and if, if God is convicting you over that, to carve out space and time for Him, I can tell you, carving out time for the Lord will never be wasted. It'll never be wasted. Often our, um, our senses need to be trained in order to love good and better things. And often we spend so much time filling our lives with filling our lives with things that are they're not from the Lord and that's not to say that they're necessarily evil not to say they're necessarily bad but the Lord wants better for you and I believe that he wants you to be able to be sensitive to his leading he wants you to love his word and if you're not in a place where that's a reality for you where you love spending time with him in his word where you love spending time with him in prayer i want to encourage you in all likelihood it's because you've got things in your life that are actually choking the life out of the word You've got distractions in your life. You've got things in your life that are, are vying for the affections of your heart, and they're winning. I want to encourage you to go before the Lord and to ask the Holy Spirit if that's a reality for you and how he would have you change that. Um, if you need prayer for anything, if you need prayer for anything at all, the prayer team's going to be here at the front. Um, we've also got morning tea. Um, we'd love for you to stick around and fellowship with us. We also recognize that, you know, people have got plans. They've got to get to lunches and all sorts of stuff. If you've got to go, please go in the blessing and the favor of the Lord. Thank you for coming and, and worshiping and spending time with us. Um, but what we're going to do now is the team's just going to play. You can spend time with the Lord as you will. You can go into a time of fellowship if that's what the Lord's leading into you right now. Or if you've got to go, please be blessed. But I just want to encourage you to worship Him, to make time for Him. Um, and especially in light of what we talked about today, learn to love His Word. All right, Lord, we thank You so much for this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray You would apply. Apply the very revelation of Jesus to our hearts. Open us up to love You more. Lord, convict us of distractions and waywardness in our hearts. Help us to feed upon your word and to love it.